Greetings. I'm Lori Garrett. I'm deeply honored to be here today with three of my personal heroes, and I'm going to introduce them in deference to age. So, Peter, you get introduced first. Peter Doherty, in the 1970s, discovered killer T cells. Scary phrase, killer T cells. And he proved that there were entire branches of the human immune system about which we knew next to nothing that have proven to be of vital importance, especially uh, soon thereafter understood in the context of HIV AIDS. Today, he's a key advisor to Australia's COVID response. He's at the University of Melbourne and at an institute that bears his name. He received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1996. Anthony Fauci, who is a household name here in the United States, and I'm coming to you from New York City, um, may not be quite as well known outside the US, but I would say just about every single American citizen at this point not only knows who Tony Fauci is, but has a decidedly clear opinion. <laughs> and Tony is a household name because he has run the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984. And he has guided presidents, congressional groups, and science through multiple outbreaks, HIV AIDS, Ebola, West Nile virus, Zika, E. coli in food, you name it. Tony has been in a leadership role and uh, so much so that his opponents are now calling COVID the Fauci virus. And Jennifer Doudna is the newest member of the Nobel Prize Club. She received the prize in the fall of 2020, right when we were all in Let's see, what was that? Surge number two or surge number three in our pandemic for work that she did together with Emmanuel Charpentier, who is now at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. They co-discovered CRISPR-Cas9, the sort of genetic scissors that bacteria have used since forever, uh, but humans only discovered when Jennifer and Emmanuel stumbled upon it. She's at UC Berkeley and also the Innovative Genomics Institute at UC San Francisco. I want to uh, set up our conversation by noting that as of today, roughly 14.5 million cases of COVID-19 have been recorded in the world since December 2019, with more than 3 million deaths. Those are certainly an undercount but at least it's a bench point for us to think about. Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary of the United States has dubbed this the $16 trillion virus because of the economic consequences of this pandemic. And here in the United States, the richest country in the world, supposedly the best prepared country in the world, we have had a devastating outbreak with about a third of all those cases and deaths that I was delineating. We have also seen huge surges across Europe multiple times, and now both Brazil and India are experiencing out of control surges of this terrible pandemic. We are in our fourth international surge. So I want to begin from that point with Tony. How did we get caught with our pants down, Dr. Fauci? Why wasn't the United States, which had been the global leader of all conversations about pandemic preparedness was supposedly the most prepared country in the world. How did we instead turn out to be the country with the worst epidemic in the world? I don't think there's a simple answer to that, Lori. It's a complicated situation. It relates a lot to things that went wrong, like early on, um, where our testing system just did not work and we did not I think uh, quickly uh, trans trans uh, uh, laid into the private sector, which always does better than trying to do it, you know, just from the CDC. That was the first, I think, mistake. The thing I also think, and it's just a matter of fact, I don't want to get controversial about it, but we were fighting an epidemic in the most divisive time that I've ever experienced in all of my experience with public health. And it, it was just extraordinary where you had initial denial. And then when you had public health me messages that were uh, garbled in many respects, where you were getting different mixed messages from different people. Now remember, everyone in the world with few exceptions 
got hit really badly. So it isn't as if everybody did well and we did badly, but we did worse than we should have done because of what I said. You know, the extraordinary divisiveness, the common enemy was the virus, and yet we were fighting with each other. We were giving guidelines to be careful about how you should implement public health measures, and we were giving messages to forget about it. We were saying that we need to do the following four or five things, wear a mask, physical distance, avoid congregate settings. And then you had a situation in the United States, which is different than any other country, is something that works well, is our federalist state. You have a federal government and you have 50 states that can actually do whatever they want to do. So how could you possibly fight a pandemic when you have some states where the governors are saying, no problem, do whatever you want. And you have another state that says, let's really be very, very careful about adhering to public health measures. The virus doesn't know the difference between Louisiana and Mississippi or between Maine and Vermont. <laughs> but we were acting as if we could act independently with a virus that spreads everywhere, which just doesn't make any sense. So I could go on and on with multiple others, but it underscores what I was saying. It was a very complicated reason why we did so poorly. And yet, despite all of that, and despite the uh, blockades put up, the political barricades, if you will, science delivered in record time. In 11 months, we end up with uh, two very promising vaccines. And in a matter of 13 months, we have more than a dozen vaccines right. building on what we learned from HIV, from Ebola. How, how do we achieve such great uh, success in such short amount of time, Dr. Fauci? Well, Laurie, I, I, I believe I described it pretty well in a 750 word editorial in Science a week and a half ago, where I said the story behind the COVID vaccines. And it's exactly what Peter and Jennifer and all of us know. It was the decades of investment in biomedical research that got us there. I mean, the platform technology work, people think that we thought of that, you know, in January. It was, you know, people working on the structure-based immunogen design of the prefusion spike protein that made mutations that stabilized it to be a competent immunogen. That didn't happen in January. That happened 10 years before. And I think if ever we're gonna make an argument to the general public about the value of investment and basically, I think this is exhibit number one. Well, Peter Doherty, despite that, a great achievement. We do need to show a little humility as a species, don't we? I mean, every day we're learning something new. We're discovering something about the way this virus attacks the human immune system and how the immune system itself then self attacks the body. We're still trying to figure out which of the terrible symptoms and even causes of death people are experiencing are the result of their own immune system gone awry versus direct outcome from the virus. Or, and then we have all these variants coming along that uh, are in some cases clearly escape mutations trying to escape the immune response. It's not even clear to me that we know what the correlates are of immunity, what actually represents successful immune response. So, I mean, as a guy who's been in the immunology game pretty much your whole life, when you look at where we stand right now vis-a-vis -vis this new enemy, you know, SARS-CoV-2, and what we do and don't know about our own immune defenses, what's your assessment? That's pretty right, Laurie. We know from the fact that the good vaccines are working incredibly well, that antibodies are a major protective mechanism in this virus infection. So that's clear. And in many cases, it looks as though the vaccines may give you much better protection than being infected. And we do know, I think, that the virus can, not always, but it can be messing with our immune systems in various ways. So as Tony said, we, we've had this extraordinary speed to getting great vaccines out. And the United States 
deserves a great deal of credit for that. I mean, a lot of things went wrong, but that didn't go wrong. And um, also, it, um, the fact that the vaccines are working at a very high level of efficacy, much better than, say, influenza vaccines, is, is truly extraordinary. So really, the details though, of what's actually going on within us have to some extent been set aside as everyone has rushed to try to counter this disease. They've been trying to both understand what's happening, but also get better treatments, get better approaches to handling it. And as a consequence, a lot of that really in-depth study is probably not being driven as hard as we might. I mean, a lot of the laboratory type experimental work, for instance, certainly hasn't been done as we focused on getting the diagnostics right, getting all those things out there, getting it out to people and getting people protected. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done in the long term on really understanding this disease in depth rather than just reacting to what it's doing to us. Now, the, the, it's complex. I mean, it's not only killing people, it's giving people these long-term effects, these long-haul effects that aren't really age-related. As we know, it's mainly killed older people, but these long-haul effects can really affect people of all ages. And nobody of any age should minimize the possible consequence of being infected with this. We have this chronic fatigue type syndromes. We certainly have heart and lung damage. It's having long-term consequences. So a great deal to be learned about this, but we are, whether we like it or not, part of an enormous global experiment. And what's going to be really important is as we come out of this, or as we continue through it, we look at every part of this from the economic, social, medical, research perspective and see what lessons we've learned and take those lessons on board. As we all know, human beings are very good at reacting in a crisis situation. They're not always that good at learning in the long term. You could say that again, especially when it comes to pandemics. Jennifer Doudna, Doudna excuse me, I always make that little blunder. I hope you'll accept my apology. Uh, I can't think of any field of science in my lifetime that has exploded the way CRISPR and CRISPR-Cas9 and all the other CASs has. I, it's just been uh, extraordinary. We went from viewing these repetitive sequences of in our DNA, in the genome, as uh, garbage DNA, you know, trash. Somehow it was there. It was just a lot of junk. Uh, some people literally called it junk DNA, to now recognizing that there are these amazing and precise molecular scissors that bacteria have been using since forever. And that thanks to you and Emmanuel, we finally discovered as our species uh, a trick being used by microbes since forever. And it has really exploded. And I think with that comes a sense of public expectation and Wall Street expectation that somehow this new explosion, exploding field of CRISPR science will yield great results that we can count on. Um, instantly a test that somehow can be used, you know, like that Star Trek device and say, eh, this person has COVID, eh, this one doesn't, or here's a mystery disease and we can identify it just like that. And that hasn't happened. How, how do you temper that extraordinary excitement, enthusiasm with, you know, the reality of the scientific process and what it's going to take to get us the final mile to realizing the potential, especially in the context of epidemics. Well, let's start with the fact that CRISPR is an ancient bacterial immune system. So there's a, I think there's actually a very interesting connection to the current pandemic in that regard. And scientists began studying it, you know, 10, 15 years ago because of the fundamental curiosity about how the system operated, how it compares with other types of immune systems. It's been around a lot longer than the human immune system, for example. And, um, and it's a great example of, you know, great getting back to, to Dr. Fauci's comment in the beginning about the fact that uh, a, lot of, a lot of advances in science build on decades of curiosity-driven experimentation by people who just have a passion for understanding nature. That's the story of CRISPR in, in the sort of the, I think, in the fundamental. 
And then with regard to the pandemic, so I, I, I would push back a little bit on what you said, Lori, because I would argue that not only has CRISPR taken off quickly as a as a as a you know as a research tool in laboratories around the world, but to me, it's quite extraordinary that, uh, you know, in less than 10 years from the initial publication of how CRISPR could be used for genome editing, we're already seeing the results of clinical trials, you know, for sickle cell disease. I mean, that's, that's really incredibly fast. And, um, you know, and it, okay, it hasn't, hasn't been employed uh, in a lot of patients yet, but I think we all see the potential of this to be truly transformative. And then with regard to the current pandemic, I think it's very interesting that here we have a bacterial immune system whose job in microbes is to detect viruses and destroy them. And so, of course, many, many folks have said, gee, could we use that system in the current pandemic either as a detection system or diagnostic tool and or as, a, as an actual therapy, an antiviral strategy? And I think that, you know, using it as an antiviral strategy is probably not going to happen in the current uh, situation because it's just going to take too long to figure out how to deliver it into every cell where it would be required to be beneficial in a therapeutic setting in, in an individual. But for diagnostics, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of research going on right now, both academically and in companies, suggesting that the CRISPR system will bring a great programmable way to detect viral nucleic acid, you know, DNA or RNA that comes from viruses in real time, not requiring amplification, not requiring, you know, high, uh, large, you know, equipment uh, heavy and, 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 and sort of resource heavy tests that take place in a laboratory, but potentially allowing point of care or maybe even at home testing ultimately. So I think that's where we're going to see the real impact of CRISPR in the current <laughs> pandemic is as a diagnostic tool. Can you imagine something uh, equivalent to that Star Trek tricorder for detection of uh, microbes and identification even of previously unknown microbes? Well, it's a great question. We have, you know, we have some. I have some real uh, Star Trekies in my family, so. We've, believe me, we've debated this, and um, you know I think there's a you know the system, the CRISPR system is programmable. That's how it works in bacteria. So bacteria program these uh, CRISPR proteins to find specific viruses. We imagine that we can use it in a diagnostic setting in the same way. You could imagine programming it to at the same time give you a readout about the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, but also influenza, other coronaviruses, potentially even other types of infectious agents. And that, that would be really enabling if we had ways to quickly surveil uh, the population and give people information in real time about their health. It's been a kind of holy grail as long as I can remember in infectious diseases and epidemics, the search for a sort of universal instant platform for detecting pathogens and being able to identify them and determine something about their attributes that might be a vulnerability. Peter, I know that you uh, are very concerned also about climate change. And in fact, we're nested in a summit that was initially called by the Nobel at the Nobel summit was initially called for in the context of the future of the planet vis-a-vis -vis climate change. When you look at, you know, the massive brush fires that devoured so much of Australia, in fact, uh, I think almost all news outlets were focused on Australia in December of 2019, as fires raged across one part of your uh, giant island to the other and not on Wuhan, where a new sort of tsunami was emerging in the form of what we now call COVID-19. Uh, and I wonder, when you look at the sum total of the threats posed by climate change, how do you see that connection between increased risk of pathogens and uh, the changes in our ecologies vis-a-vis -vis climate change? Yes. Yeah, so there are various interactions between infectious disease and, and climate change. 
One is as the planet warms, uh, various species that normally uh, uh, live on top of mountains, it's getting too hot for them. And other species are moving up those mountains. I think David Attenborough has referred to, to it as the stairway to extinction. Um, the other thing is, of course, the catastrophic events that are becoming more frequent. And the Australian bushfires that you're speaking about certainly uh, are an example of that. Uh, to me, they look more severe than anything I can remember in my lifetime, and I'm now pretty old. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we saw effects like the ground after the fires being so baked that it is not recovering. We saw people being evacuated from, um, from beaches. We've never done that before. Uh, the other infectious disease threats that are related to climate change are obviously related to flooding, overwhelming of sewage systems. Uh, then, of course, as the planet warms, mosquito-borne diseases moving further away from the equator and so forth. Now, advanced countries handle that pretty well. It becomes more catastrophic in, in the poorer countries. And, of course, with all this, whether it's COVID or climate change, it's always the poor of the planet who are most severely affected. So, yes, climate change is an enormous issue, but we, whereas in Australia, for instance, we've had a wonderful political response, federated system, all the state premiers, the prime minister calling together a national cabinet. We've largely kept the disease out. We're an island state, we can do that. And we have a fairly compliant population, actually, in many ways. Uh, perhaps not, perhaps more compliant than the United States. We, ne we never threw the British out and had a revolution. We always just had, we had a transition away from that. And so um, some of us wish we had thrown the British out and had a revolution, but that's a different matter. <laughs> so basically, I think we're, while we've been able to activate an enormously successful and, and coordinated response to COVID, uh, we haven't been able to do that with uh, the question of how we generate energy and uh, diminish greenhouse gas uh, 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 issues because we are a fossil fuel producing exporting state. So you can see the divided mind in the part of the, of the legislative political process here. It works well with a medical issue. And as Tony said, the, the fact that we've done so well with COVID-19 reflects decades of research, which have been greatly supported in the national, United States through National Institutes of Health, and e even across the planet, uh, though never, never as well funded as it is in the USA. And basically, governments buy into that, politicians buy into it, you'll get the rare politician who, who will attack it, but they're usually not very successful. And, uh, but on the other hand, action on climate change threatens all sorts of economic uh, imperatives. It threatens, it, it demands of us that we modify our behavior. And the most difficult things for human beings to do is once they've gained what they see as an advantage is actually to give up on that or even to contemplate changing the way they do it. So climate change, getting great action on climate change is a much more difficult issue and it's wonderful to see uh, the current United States administration taking this on in a very aggressive way. I hope it doesn't cost them too much electorally. Well, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Jennifer, I want to come back to you because I know that you have given a lot of thought to how CRISPR tools and research can be applied to climate related problems. And then you, the group that you're working with in San Francisco has made it part of their mission. I wonder if you could describe what some of that looks like. Yeah, the Innovative Genomics uh, Institute is a partnership between UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco to use gene editing to deal with issues in human health, but also in climate change. And you know, we've made a very strong uh, push in the in the in, in the climate direction, especially over the last two years. We are working primarily on rice is our is our kind of first uh, system that we're focused on. And it's a comprehensive approach. So the idea is to work towards net zero carbon farming uh, by modification of rice to be drought resistant, to be uh, to be pest resistant, to be um, to be uh, uh, more uh, sustainable in terms of, of uh, you know external fertilizers that would be, otherwise necessary. And then together with that, we're also 
taking an approach to editing soil microbes that can also help with both fertility as well as uh, carbon sequestration in the soil. Very excited about this. I think it's a, you know, it's kind of pulled together scientists who have lots of different types of expertise to do this project. And, um, you know, I think that uh, it's really the time is ripe to take a, a very comprehensive approach to this and see if we can't address some of the, 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 the real sources of climate change, including what happens in industrial agriculture. Tony Fauci, I want to come back to you because as soon as we start talking about climate change, we are, whether we like it or not, we're talking about politics. And I can't think of any scientific figure, maybe since Galileo and Copernicus, that have dealt as deeply and effectively, in your case, with that interface between science and politics. You know, I mean, I remember back when you were trying to convince Ronald Reagan that he had to take HIV AIDS seriously. And when uh, uh, you were fighting, you know, every kind of battle related to Zika, to one disease after another with every single president since 1984, both parties, and with some pretty tough cookies on Capitol Hill. And you've managed to protect budgets. You've managed to protect science as a mission. And now you find yourself in this huge lockdown battle, uh, as, as you described, in the most deeply divided America, many say that we have seen since our Civil War of the mid-1800s. What, what are the lessons here? And in particular, there aren't very many scientists who have your skill set in terms of politics and the ability to speak to average citizens or less than average politicians. Uh, where do we go from here? How do we develop that skill set? How do you transfer your skill set? And how do we protect the mission of science as it goes into ever more controversial territory? Well, Lori, I think the most important thing is to just maintain your integrity of sticking with the science. Um, and sometimes the science leads to inconvenient truths that make people very uncomfortable. And you just have to make up your mind that the most important thing to do is to maintain the in your own integrity and the integrity of the science. You ask about um, dealing with different presidents of different persuasions. Um, you know, the first time I went in to see Ronald Reagan and to deliver the inconvenient truth that I thought he was not, he should have been more using the bully pulpit of the presidency to alert the world that we were dealing with an emerging catastrophe. Uh, when I went in there, a good friend, an old a person who had experience in the White House told me something that I've lived by for the last, you know, 37 years of advising seven presidents. And it was a very interesting, simple thing he told me. He says, when you go into the White House every time and you walk into that, open the door of the West Wing, tell yourself this may be the last time I'm ever gonna go in there because I might have to tell the president something he doesn't like and I might not get asked back. When you go in saying, wow, I'm awestruck. This is a really amazing place. I want to get asked back. Once you fall into that trap, you may compromise your integrity and start telling people happy talk when really you need to tell them the truth. And what happened is that I was fortunate because I dealt with presidents who were able to see that, respect me and ask me back. So, I mean, if I had gone in and given happy talk all the time and didn't stick by the science, I think likely they would have lost respect for me and they wouldn't have asked me back. So the lesson is speak the truth and just stick with the science. Speak the truth, stick with the science, don't deliver happy talk. That's a pretty good way to wrap it up. We have reached our time limit. I want to very much thank Peter Doherty in Melbourne, Jennifer Doudna in Berkeley, and Tony Fauci and Bethesda for joining us today. Thank you very much.